Hey, Kelsey. Hey, Brooke. We want to tell everyone what's happening in today's episode. Today, we are going to talk about the myth that there is one woman's issue, and we're going to do a deep dive into women's suffrage. Yes, let's get into it. Hello, and welcome to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%, the podcast that explores what happened to the women in history class. Now, here's your host, Kelsey Brooke Eckert, and her partner in crime, Brooke Neva Sullivan. Episode four, Herstory's Complicated. Topic, suffrage. One of the most problematic things you'll see in a teaching of women's history is the oversimplification and summarizing of women's history to make it seem like all women agree on whatever happened in the past. What? <laughs> Wait, no. Women can't agree on everything? There's not, not a unanimous vote for everyone? <laughs> right. And I think the reality is, is that even though there are issues that women were involved in, within those individual issues, women were all over the map on what they thought about that issue, about um, what we should do about it, who should be involved, and the pace at which change should occur. I mean, it's really relevant for today's society of how women feel about different social topics, different religious topics, and certainly political topics. We're all over the map, which is good that we have diversity of thought. We should. We're not one solid organism of woman. <laughs> right. So I think that the 2016 election cycle is a really good example of what we're talking about so that people can understand how currently women don't agree. <laughs> um, Donald Trump was shown or heard on tape um, bragging about sexually assaulting women and Democrats claimed like no woman could ever possibly support this man. And here in New Hampshire, um, we had a Republican senator, Kelly Ayotte, who um, was fighting in a really competitive uh, re-election bid for yep. the Senate that year. And she was running against our former state governor, Maggie Hassan. And New Hampshire is one of those cool states where all the representatives were female at the time. So yeah, it was. Cool. <laughs> it was very cool. Kelly Ayotte, after uh, the sexual you know, assault tapes come out, basically says, I can't back this guy. And, and Which, um... Good move. Good. Probably a good move on her part. But I think it also probably cost her her It spot. totally did. You know, everybody thought that's the way that women think. And when Trump wins the election, it feels like all these women start coming out of the woodwork. Yeah. Finally willing to say, yeah, I voted for Trump and I supported him and I think he's great and whatever they think. I know. I always, it's, it is surprising when you see his rallies and there's women behind him and you're like, so there is women that are interested in, or are those the only women at the rally that they just put behind him in the speeches? Yeah, I, do, I mean, I definitely think that there's some women propped up there, but there were women who voted for him. Absolutely, there has to be. And I remember NHPR running, like, story after story of all of these women who were coming forward basically saying that they had been silent, but they voted for him anyway because they couldn't, for whatever reason, vote for Hillary Clinton right. or because they actually liked Donald Trump. And this moment in time, and I, I remember everybody probably had the same moment um, the night of the election, either glee or shock, you know, horror in my, my case. Yeah, I remember waking that, up at 3 a.m. It that was tough. Hillary hadn't won the election, and um, and and come this sort of reckoning that women could possibly have have not wanted a woman president, right? Yeah, I can remember going to the voting booth and then calling my mom in tears. I was like, we get to vote for the first female president together. Like, what a big moment. And we were crying on the yeah. phone, and we were so excited that this was part of our our history. And then come to wake up at 3 a.m. and find out that that's not the case was definitely earth-shattering. Earth-shattering for me. And I think that this illustrates that there isn't really a single women's voting block. No. That women don't vote in unison. Um, and that there are all sorts of differences in what influences a woman's vote. Um, some of the biggest ones are race, 
age education. And so because... Which they should. Like, uh, yes, that makes complete sense. There's not one circular women's vote. Right. So students of history should not have been shocked. I should not have been shocked in 2016 by women's behavior because our history shows that women have disagreed forever. (laughs) And so um, women have stood on both sides of almost every issue in U.S. history, in world history, in things that were involved in the male sphere, things that were dominating the female sphere, and um, this should not be shocking, but it was, I think, in 2016 for a lot of reasons. Absolutely. Our traditional teaching of women's history has been satisfied to summarize women's contributions, and so they will say things like, meanwhile, all women were doing (laughs) da-da-da-da-da-da-da. And, you know, like, the, the, the best example is, like, the traditional role of tending to the home. Cool. All women were tending to the home throughout all of world history? Like, I mean, no. that's just, that paints such an inaccurate photo. You can't summarize half the human race's behaviors, opinions, thoughts, actions, and what essentially this summary does is it buries women's story. Um, and it's not really t- accurate. It's not really accurate at all. Um, and I, it's also not really even reflective of critical thought. And you couldn't possibly do the same thing for men, so why would we do it for women? Yeah, like, what if you were just like, all right, 1992, all men whittled wood. Meanwhile, men were... Whittling wood. Whittling wood. In 1982. I don't know when people whittle wood. I think they still do. All right. But even, even like, a topic, like, all men were involved in the war effort. No, they weren't. Yeah. All men were protest. Like, some men were protesting the war effort. What, it, like, yeah, what would even be the end of that sentence? Men were, meanwhile, what? And if the, you can't say the same for men, you can't say the same for women. What if just everyone was home? <laughs> oh, wait, that's 2020. <laughs> <laughs> Except meanwhile, <laughs> exactly. There are so meanwhile, the men workers who are working <laughs> right now. So, <laughs> this brings us to suffrage. Uh, August eighteenth is the centennial of women's suffrage, mm-hmm. and therefore we have to do it justice. Yes, yes. So wait, why haven't we done this topic before? I feel like we cannot be like three episodes in, and this is now co- like that should have been topic one. <laughs> Yeah. Women's suffrage is awesome. It's a really cool... (laughs) I'm sorry. Voting is awesome. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) (laughs) Women suffering (laughs) to get the vote? Not so cool. No, not so much. But um, the topic of women's suffrage is a really cool one for the post-feminist women out there and post-feminist students because we love hearing moments, uh, stories of women being badass. Yeah, and like rebelling against the system. Yeah, and suffrage is just packed full of those examples. I haven't wanted to do it so far. And the reason is, is because it's overdone. And in fact, it's probably the only topic I can guarantee most history teachers teach in their classrooms. Okay. So it's, it's easy is what you're saying. It's easy because it hits the, all the hallmarks of his story. It's political. It's It's political. There's an amendment. There's, um, published documents related to that. Right? There's action and there's activism. Action and yep, yeah, and there's, you know, moments there, there's all sorts of documents like court records and all sorts of things. And photos and newspaper clippings. It's co- it's covered. It's covered. And so therefore it gets all that attention. Here's my critique of the attention <laughs> that I know, gets. I'm like, all right, how why are we going here then? Right. So the problem is is that it gets summarized. And um a lot of the voices of the past get lost. We heroify some of the women, um, mm-hmm. Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Alice Paul. All names I've actually heard of. This is good. That's good. Um, but uh, we make the same mistakes that we make when we heroify men. Sure. And we don't look at their racism, for example. Um, and that is problematic, right? So, yeah. So... I want to do um, an accurate telling of women's suffrage, and that's really hard. And the reason it's really hard is because women's suffrage took place 
all across the country and involved women from all walks of life, um, it, you know, the rich, the poor, um, all races, and, um, you know, there, you could argue that to this day there are still people that are fighting the fight for suffrage. Um, and so this is, um, this is a really, really tough topic, um, but it's definitely cool. Um, and it's super relevant. Yeah. If you really enjoy our podcast today, I want to give a quick shout out to another history teacher that's out there. She's doing a podcast called Making Her Story, and her entire season is dedicated to women's suffrage, and it's really, really great. Each one goes into a ton of depth on different So if topics. we want to go dig into some more and listen to another amazing female-run podcast, yeah. here we go. Yeah. Cool. Making Her Story. Where to start is, is tricky. There is... I can see you, like, squirming in your chair. It's so tricky. (laughs) Um, In the very, very early colonial era, um, a woman inherited land um, and was then um, treated poorly um, and discriminated against and wasn't able to vote um, to help make it, you know, she was a land owner. And um, so she demanded the right to vote. And so that was back in the 1600s. So women have been asking for the right to vote for a very long time. And here was a land owning female who wanted the right to vote and didn't get it. But... but in that time, she had power because she owned land. Because she owned land. But she wasn't allowed to make decisions about the land. So they could, like, up the taxes on her property. They yep. could, you know, ask her to pay more into the community fees. Yeah. So she demanded the right to vote because of all of those things. Yeah. And um, so where do, like, where do you really start the suffrage movement? Um, there's Abigail Adams, who during the Revolutionary era wrote to her husband and said don't forget to you know don't forget the ladies remember the ladies in her letter um was she advocating for suffrage not really she was advocating for rights and protections for women okay um and so where do you really begin most people most historians point to the abolitionist movement as sort of the turning point for women demanding the right to vote specifically Okay, why there? Why abolition? So, the abolition movement really highlights women's inequality. Okay. There are lots of women, black and white, advocating for the abolition of slavery. And within this movement, they become incredibly vocal. Um, William Lloyd Garrison is a white man who founded The Liberator, which is an abolitionist newspaper, he was based here in New England, and um, he, you know, highlighted and, and met and introduced Frederick Douglass to the rest of the world by putting him on a lecture circuit. So he, he was a strong advocate for... Huge. Yeah, he founded the American Anti-Slavery Society, and um, he was a huge proponent of women's rights as well. Um, But many of the men, especially white men, even black men, though, within the anti-slavery society were still very uh, conservative in what they thought women should be allowed to do within the movement. And so... Oh, interesting. So William Lloyd Garrison reaches out to some of the black women who maybe were slaves, right? And okay. said, hey, can you write about your experience as a slave? And those women wrote, you know, wonderful pamphlets and essays about their life and their experience, and he publishes them. Um, later, abolitionists say, you know, we're sending Frederick Douglass around the country to tell everybody about his experience being a slave. Why don't we send some of these black women to go around and okay. tell their experience as slaves and people don't think that it's a woman's place to be speaking in public this was one of the like areas that's barred to them no one can see me rolling my eyes but there they are yeah so public speaking is one of the biggest one of the first big battles and so you have these women who lived the experience of being a slave and they're not really given a platform to to speak about it well think about that time period women are celebrated for being you know polite, kind, docile, meek, mild, mild mild-tempered. It's like all of these feminine 
lesser than qualities were very highly thought of. Public speaking is just one of the ways that we can see the abolitionist movement had a sexism problem. In 1833, they had a massive gathering in Philadelphia, and there were 64 abolitionists there, but only a handful of them were women, Lucretia Mott, Linda White, Esther Moore, and Sidney Ann Lewis. Um, but all of those women that I just mentioned are white, and no black women were invited to attend. Oh, interesting. Because of this, Lucretia Mott gathered a group of women, and they formed their own anti-slavery society. And so there was sort of this gendered segregation within the abolitionist movement. Sarah Maps Douglas, Margareta Fortin, Hetty Reckless, these are all women that signed on to participate in this women's anti-slavery society. These black abolitionists were very bold in their willingness to speak and publish their works. Hetty Reckless and Harriet Jacobs unflinchingly told their stories. I've created a compare and contrast uh, lesson plan for teachers to utilize, looking at the difference of being a female indentured servant using uh, Harriet E. Wilson, and then being a slave using Harriet Jacobs, both African American women, but um, two different titles, you know, indentured servant versus enslaved. Harriet Jacobs talks about being an enslaved woman and how, in addition to all of the labor that she was doing, she was being sexually harassed by her owner and decided to escape in order to avoid his advances. That said, these harrowing stories of black women were often not treated uh, the way they should have been. They should have been the linchpin of the abolition movement, and instead, white women really stole the stage. Um, Sarah and Angelina Grimke are two women who grew up uh, as Charleston aristocracy in the South, and they own slaves. And um, both of these girls, who they're, you know, I forget how many children, but they're the youngest of, of a whole horde of Grimke children, <laughs> and um, they end up leaving the South and abandoning their heritage and coming to the North living in Philadelphia where there was a huge, um, you know, sort of congregation of people that were abolitionists and um, they abandoned their faith and everything to come join the abolitionist cause. cause. And they, um, she, you know, Sarah Grimke and Angelina Grimke travel around the country uh, giving lectures and they face pushback from their male, you know, colleagues and basically they don't think that these women should be talking publicly. Um, they came to New Hampshire and here in New Hampshire they were faced, um, they spoke at a church and they were speaking to what was called a mixed audience. There were men and women in the audience and um, people thought that that was inappropriate, that women would be addressing men in that <gasps> way. And so they rallied around the church and like there were protesters outside of their church. And um, so anyway, those two women are, are really interesting and we could spend a, de you know, a decade just talking about those two yeah. women in particular um, and all that they, they gave up for this. But what, what they and all of the women that were part of the abolitionist movement start to realize is that if we don't start advocating for our own right to mm -hmm. speak, right, then we are not really, like, we, we can't really help the slave because they're not even listening to us. And, and the Grimke sisters have lived experiences as slave owners. You've got African-American women who have been slaves, and they want to talk about this. You also have um, free black people in the North, free black women in the North, who are terrified that slavery could expand, and they're talking about things like the... Fugitive Slave Act and the fact that people can, you know, come and steal slaves from that have escaped to the north and bring them back. And um, so there's this this there's this really strong tie between abolition and this this reform cause and women's suffrage. Abolition is only one of many causes that's important to women. Okay. Um, and I'll just rattle off a couple. Temperance, which was the movement to abolish alcohol pro prohibition. Sure. Um, trying 
trying and and this it you know we learn we look at that in retrospect after prohibition but um the amount that people were drinking in that time because of a lack of clean drinking water and everything was really bad and so most people were, were drunk and the impact that alcoholism had um on women and children yeah, um, the as family. the primary victims, right, was was terrible. And so temperance reform became a huge movement for women. And in fact, the Women's Christian Temperance Union was probably the most powerful organization of women than in, in the whole 19th century. Um, there's also the movement for equal pay, um, which has been around <laughs> since the dawn of time um, and still is here. I'm sorry, what's that one? I've never heard of it. You've never heard of that? Mm -mm. (laughs) So, all of these different movements sort of lead women to start talking about the the issues that they're having and then they realize that they can't even talk about it because people won't give them a spot at the the table. But I kind of love that there's multiple movements happening at the same time because women are just done. They're like, I need... A voice. I need to be heard. I have to move forward with the thing that I'm passionate about. And so they're creating these groups of women and cohorts, and they're supporting each other, and they're finding speaking engagements. Yep. Like, great work. Okay, now go get your vote. Right. <laughs> this is a semi-decent moment to pause, so we're going to take a short break, and we will be right back. Today's podcast is sponsored by Simply Sunflowers. Simply Sunflowers is a female-owned and operated jewelry, accessory, and gift boutique located on Main Street in Plymouth, New Hampshire. It's the perfect place to purchase a gift to celebrate yourself or one of the remarkable women in your life. Check out Simply Sunflowers online at www.simplysunflowersnh.com or follow them on Instagram, Simply Sunflowers NH. Today's podcast is sponsored by Explore Plymouth, New Hampshire. Looking for things to do in the greater Plymouth area? Explore Plymouth NH. It is your one-stop guide for all things to do, places to eat, and where to stay. It even has an hour-by-hour event calendar that lets you know what's happening in the area. From live music to workout classes to special events, hop on the site and then go to Explore Plymouth NH. Visit ExplorePlymouthNH.com or follow along on Instagram, Explore Plymouth NH. If you think what we're doing is awesome, consider making a donation to fund our work on our website, www.remedialherstory.com. If you are a teacher and have an idea or lesson that features or is about a woman, and you think it fits in a typical curriculum, or you have something that should be included in class because, hello, women are half of humanity, contact us through our website, www.remedialherstory.com. If you would like to contribute as a guest lecturer, be sure to say that. If you would like to come to a live recording, also contact us through our website, www.remedialherstory.com, and tell us what you hope to gain from the experience. You can also follow us on Instagram, at Remedial Herstory, or on Twitter, at Remed Herstory. So, in 1848, there is a much discussed uh, Seneca Falls Convention. Okay. And this happens in Seneca Falls, New York. Uh, it's right off I-90, if you've ever been there. <laughs> um, they, the women uh, gather there. There are men in the audience. There are no black women in the audience, and only one black man, Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass will actually attend almost all of the women's rights conventions, um, annual women's rights conventions from that point forward. Um, Interesting. So, so yeah, and I'm going to read something from yeah. him as the only black person in attendance, but... Um, the Seneca Falls Convention has been sort of blown up in retrospect, um, but at the time it wasn't necessarily this big landmark moment in women's history. Um, it was the first convention to uh, really talk about women's rights. It was not the biggest. There were much bigger ones that occurred in the years that followed. The Seneca Falls Convention wrote the Women's Declaration of Sentiments, and the Stanford History Education Group is, uh, creates all sorts of wonderful activities and lesson plans for teachers to use, and they have a really great one on the Seneca Falls um, document that they produced, okay. the, the Declaration of Sentiments. 
This um, declaration basically copied all the language of the Declaration of Independence and um, but just you included know, women included women in it and then all the grievances which in the original Declaration of Independence were addressed to the King of England the grievances were addressed to men and these are sort of the things that have um, held women back and each of the grievances were voted uh, on and agreed by um, the, the group that the was there in you know that was present and um, the last one that they included was not being able to vote. And this was the most contentious one because a lot of women, um, even those in attendance, didn't think that that was necessarily their place um, or that that wasn't necessarily the thing that will fix all this, right? Because really? you can see that, you know, we're still fighting for equal pay right now and we have the right to vote. So um, so this is, is kind of a tricky issue. So. Interesting. Yeah, yeah very of interesting. And like, I wonder too if a lot of women in that circumstance felt that their household had one vote, and so if they voiced their opinion to their spouse or partner, that they would be heard. Right. I don't know. Just a thought. Well, that is what the the structure was intended for, right? The man right. represented the house, and so each household got a vote. And if you give the vote to women, now some households are getting two votes, right? And what does that do to single bachelor men, right? Are they are going to get outvoted by the men with who are married, right? So it's kind of an interesting, interesting philosophy. Because those single women, they would never vote independently. Right. <laughs> so um, I want to read a little bit about what Frederick Douglass sp- said. He he did speak. He gave a speech. He was asked to give a speech um, while there. It was interesting that they didn't include any African American women at this convention, even though there were lots of African American women that were active in abolition in all sorts of other causes and would have benefited. Um, and one of the, one of the most prominent and, and writing a lot at the time was Harriet Jacobs. And so, you know, you got these women that aren't, aren't even allowed to be there. So Frederick Douglass, who really can't speak to women's experience, um, Oh, he can't. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Is asked to represent all, all black women. So, um, that said, I, I do think he does a decent job and he said, When I look around on this assembly and see the many abled and eloquent women full of the subject, ready to speak, and who only need the opportunity to impress this audience with their views and thrill them with their thoughts that breathe words that burn, I do not feel like taking up more than a very small space of your time and attention, and shall not. I would not, even now, presume to speak, but for the circumstance of my early connection with the cause and of having been called upon to do so by one whose voice on this council we gladly obey. Men have very little business here as speakers, anyhow, and if they come here at all, they should take back the benches and wrap themselves in silence, for this is an international council, not of men, but of women, and women should have all the say in it. This is her day in court. I do not mean to exalt the intellect of woman above man's, but I have heard many men speak on this subject, some of them most eloquent to be found anywhere in the country, and I believe no man, however gifted, with thought and speech, can voice the wrongs and present the demands of women with the skill and effect, with the power and authority of woman herself. I mean, nailed it. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> I thought he did a good job. It would be nice if, you know, black women herself were in the room, but... <laughs> or a black woman delivered that speech and said, me. It's yeah. like, this is happening to me. Yeah. So it's a lovely, a lovely speech, and it's also a lovely sentiment from somebody who sees the, the sort of joint cause of abolition and suffrage together, and everybody sort of getting this, this, uh, getting enfranchised together. So um, one of the interesting things is that a lot of people sign on to the Declaration of Sentiments, and then um, within days, actually redact their signature, um, and so there's sort of this Whoa. backwards movement. So a lot of people say like, "Oh, Seneca Falls, this big moment in history," and it's kind of not. Like it's sort of this like, it's you know, like a one blight. step forward, one step back, kind of like. You how know. can you be half into activism? Yeah. <laughs> like, how can you be half into wanting those things? I think a lot of people felt social pressure afterwards. Like, how could you? What are, what are you trying to be a man? Like, are you manly? Um, and there's a lot of a lot of pushback. 
feedback from family members, from oh, society. Man. So um, the conventions continued, and every year um, there was another convention, and African American women do attend the later conventions. Thank goodness. Um, and then in 1860, everything goes to hell when the Civil War breaks out. And so they stop having these annual conventions. So after the Civil War ends, um, women's status is in a really interesting place because during the Civil War, Lots of women had been involved as nurses, and so they had gotten all of this um, prestige and recognition. Um, Clara Barton, for example, founded the American Red Cross um, during that time. Um, so there, there's a lot of cha you know there's a lot of recognition of women's work and contribution, um, but no progress on women's suffrage. Following the Civil War, there's a whole bunch of different amendments that are passed to help. Um, end slavery and give African Americans the vote. The first of these amendments is the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which abolishes slavery. Mm -hmm. The 14th Amendment is important today for immigration reasons, um, but at the time it was basically intended to say that all these uh, you know, enslaved people who are now free um, because of the 13th Amendment, um, they are all naturalized citizens. Right. Okay, so if you're born here, you're a citizen. citizen. So 13th abolishes slavery, 14th makes them citizens, and the 15th, uh, and this is the most important one, the 15th, for women suffrage. <laughs> it was sla <laughs> I think slavery was very important, let's make that very clear. Um, but for, when it comes to women's suffrage, the most important one is the 15th Amendment says that um, all men born and naturalized in this country uh -huh. have the right to vote. And it's the first time, everything before that was just ambiguous, right? When they said mankind, you know, we all knew what they meant. Um, they meant land-owning men, right? And now, um, with the 15th Amendment, the word male is in the Constitution. 14th Amendment says all people born and naturalized in this country are citizens. Uh -huh. Well, if you're a citizen and you can't vote, then you're a second-class citizen. Right. Right? And so women now see this as the biggest... Th th there's constitutional foundation to basically say, you, this is discriminatory, right? Right. Um, this also divides people. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton are best friends, and they have worked on this cause forever together. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton is the brains of the operation. Susan B. Anthony is a radical who will basically do whatever for mm -hmm. the cause. She's down. She's down. They see the 15th Amendment as a huge insult, and they feel like the African men that they have been working with to get abolition have abandoned them. Rightfully so. I mean, when you basically got what you needed, and then we needed what we needed, and you left. <laughs> yeah. But um, there are other people, like Lucy Stone, for example, who said that this is, you know, if we get African-American men the right to vote, African-American men can advocate for African-American women. And it's giving African-American women a voice. Uh, for like the a first partial, time. A partial voice for the first time, right? Because white men are likely not really representing African-American women. Yeah, I would say that's a no. <laughs> so, um, so there's this huge division. And um, whip. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton basically take the approach of suffrage at whatever the cost. And the cost is racism. Lucy Stone says, no, African American men having the right to vote means that there is a wider electorate and eventually women will get the right to vote and will work with African American men to get that vote. Okay. So um, this results in the founding of two different women's suffrage organizations, the National Women's Suffrage Organization and the American Women's Suffrage Organization. Well, not, that's not confusing or anything. Right, and then eventually they merge, so just hold on to your hat. Okay. So <laughs> I'm like, get it together. <laughs> I, Frederick, I hate to like bring them into this, but Frederick Douglass um, was in uh, in an audience at one point, and he, I'm going to paraphrase here, but he says okay. essentially. When women, because they are women, are dragged from their homes, their heads bashed upon the pavement, 
then they will have the urgency to vote like African American men have the Whoa. urgency to vote. And this woman in the audience was like, well, doesn't that, like, aren't, you know, African American women lynched too? And he goes, yes, African American women are being abused and they are being beaten, but it's not happening because they're women. It's happening because they're black. And this is, I think this really illustrates sort of the division, right, right. that's occurring. That um, we, like, that, and, and essentially, and this is a pattern with all rights movements, because really, all these people should have the right to vote. Yeah, like, but why are having, we fighting over, like, breadcrumbs when we want the bread? Right. And, and, and this happens all the time. And so, you know, it's, it, it drives me nuts when I see it in present day, where people who should be on the same side are turned against each other, fighting. Yeah, you for know, a doing, minimal divide minimal divide because, you know, they, they should agree. Um, and unfortunately I think that, um, history is on the side of Frederick Douglass and Lucy Stone's and Lucy Stone, but Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony choose the path that I would argue ultimately gets the suffrage amendment passed, but it is a path that abandons their black brethren who they've otherwise been fighting alongside the whole yeah. time. So, um, they have the two organizations, the two suffrage organizations have very different visions for how to get the vote. The American woman suffrage organization pursues a state by state path. And so they get the suffrage amendment passed in individual states. And so by the time we get to 1920, when the amendment is passing, there are actually millions of women in the country that already can vote in their state. So pause you here for a sec. This is really how we get things through, is that we try and tip states so that we can get the government to adopt. Like I think of like legalizing gay marriage. Yep, it was the same pattern. Okay. Yeah. So... This is another interesting part of women's history. So the whole point here is that we don't agree, right? Let's go back to that early <laughs> theme. Um, and so one of the other, so we're talking about a racial division. We're talking about, Lucy Stone is, is a white um, advocate, I should mention that. But, um, but she sort of sides with the African-American sort of vision. Um, or, or, and really it's the division over the 15th Amendment. Right. Um, so the... Other, another major division is West versus East. One of the interesting things it, that's a pattern in women's history is wherever there is less civilization, women have more rights and women are valued more. Do you feel like, is that because they're an equal partner in farming, in agriculture? Whatever in the effort is in... Their equality is greater. Yeah. So in early, early colonial America, there was relatively egalitarian treatment between men and women. The further west the frontier goes, that, that egalitarianism stays. So out west, right, the cowgirls are farming, are herding cattle, are putting in a ton of work, and, you know, they're sweaty and dirty right alongside everybody else. They know how to shoot guns, right? Yeah. So it, it makes sense. I mean, they are landowners sometimes by themselves, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of the traditions and civilization that occurs on the east, the proper east coast, right, actually limits people. And so, you know, it's interesting, but, like, basically none of New England gives women the right to vote before um, the, the, the federal amendment passes. And it's out west, you know, sort of in the frontier where all these women are, are have a right to vote. And so in the west, it, which is backwards in a lot of ways, is actually forward in other ways. Well, I think when we use the word backwards, we think of, like, modernization of technology at that time period, not necessarily of values. No. Um, so out west, the American Women's Suffrage Association is making progress. They, uh, Wyoming is the first state to grant women the right to vote. And um, Colorado shortly follows. You know, they, they wiggle their way around the West. Um, on the East Coast, nada. So, one of my favorite moments in U.S. history is in 1872. Mm -hmm. Susan B. Anthony goes, um, she gets 14 of her gal pals, and goes to uh, register to vote. 
And I think I have thought talk about like the gumption and like the energy. So they walk in to the town hall or where, wherever you register to vote. And I, I pity the poor man sitting behind the counter. Because one of the themes that Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony adopt that is relatively valid is that these women are some of the most educated women that have ever existed, educated people that have ever existed in world history. Because literally, the world is telling them that they don't need to do anything outside the home. So what do they do? They sit and they read. Right? And so <laughs> when Susan B. Anthony walks into this town hall, she is by far the smartest person in the room. Yeah. And so this poor little town clerk or whoever is behind the counter oh. is, is just about to get obliterated. And so she walks in and she goes, well, under the 14th Amendment, I'm a citizen and citizens have the right to vote. So I'd like to register to vote today. And so she and her, her buddies all get registered to vote. Couldn't you just see that like poor little man? Like this is such a movie scene. It's like... You know, the doors swing open, the dust settles, yeah. she walks up to the counter, licks yeah. the pen, puts it down. <laughs> I'm here to register the vote, yeah. and my I'm name's British Susan. Now, apparently. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just thinking of like old timey accent. Oh, sure. Yeah. Susan B. Anthony? Yeah. And like does a big swig of the Y. Like, yeah. here we go. Yeah. And the little guy has like those little spectacle glasses, like pushes them up his nose, and he's, he's just like, like um, mm, I guess so. I think next. <laughs> So he registers her and all these other women. Get it. And a couple weeks later, you know, it's the, the voting day, and um, they go to vote for a presidential election. And they vote. And the people in the town are like, I, we don't, we let them register to vote, but we're not really sure. <laughs> the little guy with the glasses went home that night, and he told his wife, he was like, and these ladies came in today. Yeah. <laughs> So um, they put their ballots in a separate ballot box, which is like, you know, separate but equal. You was, know, it, like, <laughs> was it pink? <laughs> right. So they don't really know what to do. So obviously people, that, you know, this is a problem because in New York, in the state of New York, this is not allowed, which is where she's from. Um, so they, um, there's a court case and Susan B. Anthony is arrested. I, here's another moment that I would just love to have been a fly on the wall. So she, the police officer shows up at her door and she, you know, she's already thought like, oh, she knows so when I am arrested, yeah, she wants this is what will happen so that she can sue. Right. So, um, so she's arrested, and this poor little cop comes to her door. And Let's she, say he's the brother of the town clerk, because yeah. that just makes like Barney. Yeah, he's not, <laughs> but sure. And so he comes to the door, and um, she's like, if you're going to arrest me, let's do this. So, like, I want handcuffs, and I want you to escort me out. And he's like, ma'am, can you just get get in the car? And she's like, I don't, <laughs> don't want to do this, Susan. <laughs> We've had a lot of uh, altercations from you recently. <laughs> yeah. So she gets arrested. She spends, uh, I don't remember if it's a night or a couple nights at the, the town. But she goes jail. to the, the clink. She goes to jail. And her lawyer can't handle seeing a woman in jail, so he pays her bail. And she's like, what are you doing? You know, why are you paying my I bail? need to suffer in I here. I need to suffer in here to, like, make a stink about, yeah. you know, this, this poor treatment. So um, her court case is actually a really cool um, scene to act out with your students. And yes. I've done it many times. It's really, really fun. Um, so her lawyer is a man named Henry R. Selden, and he is wonderful. Another man who just is a great advocate for women's rights. And, um, she is not allowed to speak at the appellate trial. And so that's uh, the one because, well, I'll, we'll get into it. But, okay. So, um, the, the, the person representing the government in this case, um, Crowley, I believe is his last name. He, um, his argument is like so dumb. It's just basically his entire, he, he gives this whole speech in the beginning, you know, op opening arguments or whatever. Yep. And the whole time, if you could like boil it down, he's like, um, so she's a woman and, um, she voted. So yeah. <laughs> Guess that's wrong. Makes me think of like a surfer dude just like showing up. Yeah, like, I mean he said it better than that, but like that. Look, it. man. <laughs> Look, man. She's female. I mean, she's got boobs. Yeah. We've got problems. <laughs> 
So he makes his argument. Then um, Selden wants to call Susan B. Anthony to the stand. Yes, put her and up there. So he wants to like give her the floor because she's the smartest person in the world. She's right? the smartest person, and she's going to sell it. Yeah. <laughs> so they do not let her speak um, because she is incompetent as a witness to her own. Yeah. Yeah. Good try. Yeah. Oh so God. she's not allowed to speak. So. Um, I think that Henry are, like, there's lots of documents in history that are sort of like everybody reads them, right? We all read the Declaration of Independence as students. We've all heard the Gettysburg Address. I think that Henry Selden's closing arguments should be required Ooh, reading. okay. And um, so I want to read a little bit of what he said. In are you, Kelsey? Case. Let's hear this. Okay. So he goes, the only alleged ground of illegality in the defendant's vote is that she is a woman. If the same act had been done by her brother under the same circumstances, the act would have been not only innocent, but honorable and laudable. But having been done by a woman, it is said to be a crime. The crime, therefore, consists in not the act done, but in the simple fact that the person doing it was a woman and not a man. I believe this is the first instance in which a woman has been arranged in criminal court merely on account of her sex. Women have the same interest that men have in establishment and maintenance of good government. They are to the same extent by men, as men bound to obey the laws. They suffer to the same extent by bad laws and profit to the same extent by good laws. And upon principles of equal justice, as it would seem, should be allowed equally with men to express their preference in the choice of lawmakers and rulers. In the Constitution, our ancestors declared that governments derive their just powers from the sent consent of the governed. The teaching of history in regard to the condition of women under the care of these self-constituted protectors shows that men have not protected women's interests. Women have, in law, no individual existence, and consequently no action can be brought by her to redress grievous wrongs. Over the last few decades, progress has been made on behalf of women, but how has it been produced? mainly as a result of the exertions of a few heroic women, one of the foremost of whom is sits, stands arraigned as a criminal before this court today. Much has been done, but much more remains to be done by women. If they had possessed the elective franchise, the reforms which have cost them a quarter of a century of labor would have been accomplished in a year. Give them the ballot. Oh my God. God, I just love him. Go get it. Who, Go. who should play him in the movie version oh, of this? Oh, I don't know. Tom Hanks, maybe? Oh, yeah, he's good. So, <laughs> Selden advocates for Susan B. Anthony, and it's beautiful. Um, they fine her $100 for her carriage ride to the jail, and um, she... Back then, that's some big cut. Yeah, like, that's, that's a lot of money. She that's never a lot of money. pays it, and she tells them that she won't pay it in court. I don't get it. Women won't get the vote for 50 years after the passage of the 15th Amendment. So by the... 50, 50 years. 50 years from the point that they give it to African American men forward. So by the 1890s, it's kind of... Uh, everyone's like, nothing's really working. And yeah, there are some Western states that have gotten the vote... Um, but they've tried twice now to get a federal amendment to the Constitution, and they both have been struck down. The southern states are the biggest problem. Like yeah, they're, they're, they're the blockade. They're the blockade. And so the white women um, in the north basically start catering to southern racist ideology. And so it's kind of weird because some of these women like were abolitionists, and now they're, they sound racist and I mean they're making arguments like we should give white women the right the right to white educated women the right to vote so that we can outweigh the black vote in the south right because if you have if you double the, the voting white electorate then white supremacy can reign there's no like dancing around it it's white supremacy the argument that they start making um and there are lots of black women that are trying to challenge the direction that this organization is going. Probably the foremost and one of the most badass women in history is Ida B. Wells. Oh yeah! Okay. Let's get into that. She begins a campaign to basically redirect women's suffrage to the cause of African Americans. And she's like, suffrage is really important, but holy moly lynching, right? Yeah. This is preventing black men from actually being 
able to exercise their right to vote. So um, she writes pamphlet after pamphlet after pamphlet. Eventually, all of these get published into one like yeah. hundred page document. Um, and she's incredible. She goes head to head with the head of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, who's also a suffragist. All these women are suffragists, but it's sort of second to the other things that are important to them. And um, eventually gets her to pass, you know, some stuff about about lynching you know, and, tr and mm -hmm. trying to change that. Um, but this the tension between you know the the different causes and the different issues right temperance lynchings suffrage um and it's a lot and not and and so um eventually because of the stalemate and where everything's going um the american women's suffrage association and the national women's suffrage association emerge and so they become ah, the NASA. moment yeah, they become NASA. And they basically, it's it's sort of a non-moment. It's like, okay, well, none of our strategies are really working, so <laughs> let's join forces. And um, But they sort of continue the trend of catering to the Southern, you know, men and basically saying this is a great way to establish white supremacy, you know. And um, and so this is, this is really problematic. Um... Around this time, Susan B. Anthony retires, and she passes the reins of the organization to Carrie Cat. And Carrie Cat sort of looks pragmatically at the situation, and she's like, okay, we are not making progress on a federal amendment. They voted it down twice. Yeah, we need a new strategy. We need a new strategy. The state-by-state -state thing is slow, but it's working, so let's just go at that. With yeah, like what state we we, do, can we go after next in the next one? Let's snowball them, domino yeah. effect. She continues to advocate for educated white women getting the right to vote rather than all women getting the right to vote. One of the reasons they continue making this argument is because the anti-suffragists, led in large part by women, are making a pretty compelling argument against uneducated voters. And of course there are racial undertones to this position, um, but it is an interesting argument. So I wanna read a little bit from a woman named Molly Elliott Sewell. She wrote a book called The Ladies' Battle, which was published in 1911, and she was a prominent anti-suffragist. She said, it has often been pointed out that women should not pass laws on matters of war and peace since no woman can do military duty. But this point applies to other issues too. No woman can have practical knowledge of shipping and navigation, of the work and train men on railways, of mining, or in many other subjects of the highest importance. Their legislation, therefore, would not be intelligent, and the laws they devise to help sailors, train men, miners, etc., might be highly offensive to the very people they try to help. If sailors and miners refuse to obey the laws, who would have to enforce them? The men. And this, of course, is coming from a position where everything, every job is being done by men. But I think she's fundamentally wrong because, of course, no man is required to have knowledge of shipping, navigation, war, or any of those things in order to vote. So while it's an interesting argument, it doesn't apply to men, so therefore it shouldn't apply to women. The Stanford History Education Group, again, has a wonderful lesson on the anti-suffragists, and I love that they highlight women as anti-suffragists. Um, there was an anti-suffrage newspaper that's one of the sources that they use in this uh, student activity. So I highly recommend that, and that will be available on my website to everybody. And another wonderful way to teach the anti-suffrage perspective is by using political cartoons. I have a whole PowerPoint of political cartoons that I've collected over the years, and I will just post them up for everybody to have. What I do in class is I will post the political cartoon, have kids do an analysis activity, and I have included the analysis activity in the PowerPoint for you all. So getting back to the history here, of course, black women are appalled at the position that NASA is taking, but they are sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place because they are discriminated against both by race and by gender. And even within an organization that's trying to get voting rights for women, they are facing discrimination. A really good example of this would be the 1895 convention that they held where not a single black woman was included because they held the convention in the South trying to cater to white sensibilities there. 
Anna Howard Shaw uh, is also one of the major leaders of NASA, and um, she is heavily criticized by W.E.B. Du Bois, who was uh, one of the founders of the NAACP, mm -hmm. along with Ida B. Wells. He was also the first um, black graduate of Harvard. Yeah. And he basically says that in every reform movement, the biggest problem is how they treat black people within the movement. And he, in this... Um, in this essay that he wrote, he said the biggest example of this is woman suffrage, wow. and he That's specifically, a call out. yeah, he specifically calls out calls out Anna Howard Shaw, and so she read when she heard about this this letter, this public letter that he wrote, um, she responds and she says there is uh, not in the National Association any discrimination against colored people, um, if they do not belong to us it's merely because they have not organized and not made an application for membership many times we have had colored women in our program as delegates and i personally would be only too glad to welcome them as long as i'm president of the national association that really just doesn't hold up against the historical record there was a southern suffragist named kate gordon who in an interview in 1901 said the question of white supremacy is one that will be decided by giving the right of the ballot to the educated intelligent white women of the south this is a fact that many of the brightest men in the South are acknowledging today. The white women of the South hold the balance of power. Their vote will eliminate the question of the Negro in politics, and it will be a glad, free day for the South when the ballot is placed in the hands of its intelligence, cultured, pure, and noble womanhood. Whoa. Whoa. Racist. So... Yeah, that's... Yikes. So, there's sort of this division, and... Um, African American women begin to organize themselves. They, there's which all, they should. No one's, should. no one's ca calling them to the table and saying it's okay to sit here. Right, and so the the women's suffrage organization really is is a white organization, and it's it's confusing because they are had like by default they are advocating for African American women, but yeah. they might not. Right, that it is possible that they would pass a suffrage amendment that would that would allow only educated white women to. Well, right. So like that's the whole thing is they. Could get in the room where the decisions are being made and the and the papers are going forward in front of the the Supreme Court to make the and ruling and they're like they're like we'll push this forward but you have to take out black women and they like, might do it and they might do it yeah so two of the African American leaders Mary Church Terrell and Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin combine forces and they form the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. And these clubs were a little elitist among the African American community. Um, their goal was so multifaceted because they had all sorts of, of issues that they needed to address for the African American community. Their motto was lifting as we climb. And um, so of course they were focused on suffrage, but they were not solely focused on suffrage. Right. Well, lives first. <laughs> lives first. That's a reasonable priority. Yeah. Voting next. Yeah. There's a really great book called Lifting As We Climb, Black Women's Battle for the Ballot Box. Um, this is by Yvette Dion, and it is an incredible history about African-American women's struggle for the ballot, um, written by an African-American woman, um, but it's also written at a like middle to high school reading level, and um, it's wonderful. So you could have your students read that book. Um, I highly recommend it. So under the hands of Carrie Cat, the federal amendment sort of gets pushed aside, and they continue going state by state. Meanwhile, in Great Britain, women are advocating for the right to vote, and it's getting really, really tense there. And they are turning violent because the British media is suppressing everything about, um, about what's going on with suffrage. And so there's nothing appearing in the media, and so they're doing more and more extreme things. And um, so two American women are studying over there in college um, at Oxford. Yes, very smart. Um, good, good for them. Lucy Burns and Alice Paul. And so they learn bas basically really radical suffrage tactics over in England. And then they come back to the United States and they want to become members of NASA. And NASA's like, yeah, 
yeah, sure, but we're wary of you because we don't want to be like those Brits. We want to show everybody that we can vote and we're like reasonable and rational people to work with. Yeah, we don't have to act crazy to get a vote. Right. And Alice Paul sort of crosses her fingers and she's like, yeah, sure, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> and so she and Lucy Burns are put in charge and you could, there's a lot here and we could spend a lot of time on um, these two these two women, but basically they get in charge of um, the Congressional Union, which is basically this little like branch of NASA, and they are trying to get a federal amendment. It changes names a couple times. Funding changes names a couple times. But eventually they realize that Carrie Cat and Anna Howard Shaw's, you know, state by state vision for is the only way to go. Is is the only way they're gonna go. And oh. Alice Paul and Lucy Burns are like, no, we need to go directly to the top, to the federal. Like we're out. We're out. So when when NASA basically turns on them, they form their own political party, and they're called the Women, the National Women's Party, NWP. Ooh, and okay. much simpler title, also like yeah, let's like stop with all the S's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they, um, the National Women's Party, is based in D.C., and all they do is advocate for a federal amendment. They harass senators. They do whatever it takes to get the vote. And what year is this? This is, so they sort of head to D.C. around the time that Woodrow Wilson is becoming okay. president of the United States. And one of the first things they do um, prior to separating is they stage the March on Washington. That is very famous and probably yeah. in all the suffrage pictures that people are seeing online yeah, today. Yeah, all the banners. All the banners. And um, they basically have this big parade um, in time for his inauguration to basically, like, steal the show. The parade is amazing. Um, Ida B. Wells is there. Ida Wells Barnett um, is there. And they continue sort of the racist policies, and they ask the black women to march in the back. And Ida B. Wells refused. And so... Yeah, and doesn't she, she like, go right to the front? She sneaks in, yeah, and, and goes to the front, which is awesome. Um, there's a film about this moment, it's called Iron Jawed Angels, and it's one of the few films that passes the Bechdel test. Um, it does not pass the racist test, though, because it, it basically gives Ida B. Wells this, like, short, she's in two scenes in the uh. whole, in the whole show, and then the rest of it is white women. Um, but anyway, so they, um, they have this amazing parade, and it goes terribly, which is awesome for them, because the people, the police are negligent, they sort of abandon the protesters, and so the crowd turns into a mob, and like hundreds, like I think about a hundred people get sent to the hospital oh because it, of the brawl that ensues, um, and so it makes the newspapers, which is what they wanted. They wanted, wanted yeah. Yeah. So, um, Woodrow Wilson, who is a Democrat, says that he is favorable to women's suffrage, but over the course of his first term in office, he does, does nothing. nothing. Yeah, he does nothing. And, um, by the time, um, his term is up, uh, World War One is breaking out. And this I is... I just, like, don't get how a president's not like, you know what would be great? More voters. More voters. You know what would be awesome if I was running for a second term? Giving more people the vote. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. So, he is, um, real, I mean, he's in an awful position as a leader because of World War One. Sure. And World War One breaking out in Europe is horrible. And basically, he gets reelected because he's the guy that kept us out of World War One. There are lots of women suffragists who begin to abandon the cause because of World War One. Lots of them, like Inez Mulholland, head over to Europe to go on peacekeeping missions and try to keep World War One from from becoming what it was. But keeping on the theme of women not really necessarily agreeing with each other, many other women looked back at history and they said when the Civil War started, we dropped the, the cause and we didn't do anything. Right. And then we lost all the momentum and we, here we are 40 years later and we're still, yeah. you know, we're still struggling for the same thing. So they, um, decide not to stop. So when World War One breaks out and Wilson does in fact take us into, into World War One, they don't stop. And they um, basically call him out on his hypocrisy because Woodrow Wilson says, we're going to fight World War I to save the world 
like save democracy basically yeah and we're gonna fight so that german people can have democracy and not be led by you know this dictator like emperor um wilhelm and so um so people start his the the emperor of germany's title was kaiser and so women started carrying banners that said kaiser wilson right oh and so like basically likening him to the the german emperor that he's at war with and basically Smart. saying you are going to war so that all of these germans can can have a vote can have a say what about the american women that are right, right here, here yeah, right in your now, backyard that you could do something about it so um, they have a sentinel out. The National Women's Party has a sentinel outside the White House, and they are like burning um, flames every day in a <laughs> barrel and holding banners. And it's really not looking good for a president at war. This is a really interesting topic because when a president is at war, most people feel like you should rally. Yeah, behind. isn't his numbers usually more favorable? Like, uh, isn't that yes. like yeah? Usually the statistics go up when a president goes into war yep. um, because people want to trust them and the decision that they're making. Yep. So um, people get very upset and th these women are accused of being unpatriotic, right? Like, Well, yeah, I could see that's the immediate like connect the dots. Like, all right, if you don't care about the war because you're so selfish you're only caring about yourself, then right. you're not patriotic. Then you're not that's patriotic. like such an easy connection to say about them and publish in a newspaper. Like, that's clickbait. Right. Well. Back then. It's grab bait. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's not quill bait. We're beyond. We're typewriters. We're typewriters. Yeah. So tech clack clickety clack bait. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Woodrow Wilson uh, basically turns to his henchmen and he's like, "How can we get these women?" off the street because they're not letting up. And they basically, they were like, when winter comes, like, these women won't go out there every yeah. day and stand but, on the street. And of course they do. I mean, D.C. winter, not yeah. too bad. It's not, it's, meh. yeah. So they, <laughs> they, um, they try to get these women off the street. So they arrest them for blocking traffic. Good try, good try. And the women go to jail. They are fined. If they don't pay the fine, they have to stay in, in this, like, workhouse and um, they are p essentially political prisoners because they haven't actually done anything wrong, right? They were on right. the public street, and they were allowed to, to protest. Be there. Yeah, allowed to protest. They're allowed to speak, and so um, this is a really this is this is the moment, right? This is the thing that they can push back against. As the D.C. police continue to arrest the women, Alice Paul and Lucy Burns make rules insisting that like mothers aren't on the front lines, that aren't going to jail because they don't want moms separated from their children. That would be really bad PR for their organization. Um, on one of the nights where the women were imprisoned, um, they were beaten. This is known as the Night of Terror. Um, Alice Paul ends up and Lucy Burns, along with many of the other women, end up going on hunger strike while yes. they are in jail. And um, she loses tons of weight. Um, it is a little confusing because they are being arrested and then released and then arrested and then released. Um, and so this goes on for many, 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 many months. Um, Whoa. Into, into Wilson throughout the war, basically. Um, and so Alice Paul is on a hunger strike. And I think about her every time I vote because this woman How could you not? Yeah. literally like, starved herself so that I would be allowed to do this. Wilson wanted to make sure that she and the other women were not martyrs to the cause. And so they were force fed, which involved taking a plastic tube and shoving it forcibly down her throat while she resisted. They also put it down her nose. And then they cracked eggs and other things into the tube to feed her. This is big. And so eventually it gets leaked to the press that these women are starving in prison under his doorstep. He tries to um, test her psychologist. Like, he sends psychologists to basically prove that she's crazy, and she they can't because she's, she's not. She's not. Yeah, she's and, reasonable. Yeah. So um, they eventually release the women. They stop arresting them for breaking for blocking traffic. And basically because of an incredible amount of pressure, Woodrow Wilson turns to the Senate and he basically says, we need to give them the vote. He, in his speech, he actually says, I'm not doing this because of the radicals that have been on the street. <laughs> 
but like he did. And yeah. <laughs> good try. Good try. That's cute, but he did. And um, and so it's really their final efforts, their, this final push for women's suffrage that gets the vote through in 1919. Uh, and then it takes a year to ratify it. And so that's why we're celebrating the centennial now yep. um, in 2020, um, 100 years after it was ratified. And the last state to ratify it was Tennessee. And the story there is kind of cool. The, the one of the men basically switched positions the morning of because oh. he got a letter from his, a telegram from his mother basically saying, give women the vote. You know? Yeah, like, <laughs> knock it off. Yeah, and so he, he voted in favor of women's suffrage in Tennessee's uh, state house and, um, or capital, and, and women got the vote. So it was, it was kind of really a really um, big, I mean, it's a huge moment in, Absolutely. in women's Absolutely. It gives all women everywhere the right to vote, but it does not give African American women or Native American women the vote because of discriminatory racial policies that are in place around the country, and especially in the South. Right. So Afri uh, Native American women are not considered citizens until the late 20s um, and African American women be, you know will continue to fight for the right to vote you know until the Voting Rights Act um, that Martin Luther King and others decades later will advocate for so and, and um, it's it's a long road to get to that that amendment that 19th amendment that's incredible I think the thing that hits me the most about it is just that it's 50 years after African American men got the vote. It's 50 years, but then think of how long it was from till when black women got the oh, vote. Oh, an, another. Another 50 years. And another so another at least 40, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just It's crazy how slow changes. It's crazy how slow changes, but at the same time I do think whenever, you know, we start to talk about these things and, and you tell me these, you know, things I've never heard before or things that I'm vaguely remembering, um, you know, I think about, like, why? Why did it take so long? And don't we feel dumb because that happens sometimes? Like, can't, don't we look back on our history and we're ashamed that that was part of it? And, like, I don't know. That must be hard as a teacher when you sit in the classroom and you're like, yeah, we, we probably – don't like that history to look at but this is where we're at today where we've hidden so much history that's so important for us to to relive and understand and see and stop being embarrassed by it like we need to hear it yeah i i only touched on little bits of things but you can see that there's many sides to the and you can dig throughout. deep into a lot of spaces here i mean for a while for a while yeah. i mean it spans chronologically it spans across a lot of different movements within the U.S. Two wars, yep. if not now, three wars. Yeah. Um, it's impressive. It's impressive. It's a lot. So um, thank you all for joining us. That's all for now. We will have another episode next week about the two spheres, his sphere and her sphere. I hope you'll join us. I'm Brooke Sullivan. I'm Kelsey Eckert. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Kelsey. Thanks so much for listening to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to bring more voices to the conversation. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.